Last time we had someone put on Katy Perry. I feel like putting on some Katy Perry for a minute or two. Now is the time. Time to shine. I probably shouldn't put any licensed music on the main account. But <laughs> you guys should just jump on ginmusic.ai, our generative music platform. You can make... Yeah, just generate some on the spot. You can generate some on the <laughs> spot and you own it entirely. We've worked with the music industry to license all the training content so there's no risk of being sued or anything like that. Oh, that's sick. That's really cool. That's really cool. Actually, I think I've played around with that for a bit. I think I have some of the NFTs from, from that uh, when, after I've played around with it now that I remember. No, no, no NFTs yet. I think um, in the next really phase, we'll allow people to mint their tracks. The only thing that's happening on chain at the moment is when you sign up, you get issued a smart wallet, although you can use your email or social or whatever. And then when each track is generated, we put an on-chain proof of that track, like a hash, so that if any copyright disputes come up in the future, then you can kind of trace it back to the fact that it was generated from this, from this model and that, it, that you own it. The way it works here, we can start with giving a, a short introduction to the different speakers. And then next, let's also hear it from Future Words. Hey, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining in today. Glad to be here. Futureverse is a media tech company. And we have three things that we're really passionate about with 250 people across 16 countries around the world trying to do this every day. We have the open metaverse is our goal and three parts to that is protocols that enable data ownership, identity ownership, social graph ownership. Next in the middle is protocols and tools that allow anyone to create immersive content, gaming content using our generative AI. And then at the top end, we partner with the world's biggest brands and most loved IP to take that technology and connect it to their audiences. For a bit of context, Web3 Gaming has always been very focused on rewarding players financially, while Web2 is more focused on the gameplay side of things. So there's obviously different ways to reward gamers out there. Uh, so let's try and dive into what gamers actually want. Um, so, so how do, in your guys' opinion, and any of you can take this if you like, but how, how do you think Web2 or Web3 gaming differs when it comes to rewarding players? Uh, and keep in mind also, yeah, feel free to jump in, uh, Aaron. But also, I think, oh, a short note on this, the banana game is, is kind of a curve curveball there, but I'd I love to hear your thoughts. The first thing I think is that gaming is a very broad category. 3.2 billion people around the, the world play video games, and there's a lot of range in there in terms of genres and target audiences and those kinds of things and so trying to bundle that into one like bag is a little bit hard but having said that i think um the most important thing is that it's fun you know that's the whole point you know it's implied in the name game that it should be fun and something that you enjoy doing web3 can bring additional elements to that and some of that can be incentives but I think probably the misstep um, that was made in the first cycle was that we, you know, a whole bunch of bad quality games were built that were mostly a veneer on some kind of tokenomics model, as opposed to being, you know, a game that has been designed for fun from the start. Now, I think in this cycle, there's a whole bunch of interesting games coming to market that are focused on the fun, but also have this underlying economy that can work in a different way to the way that Web3, uh, Web2 worked. And I think the last thing is the promise of digital ownership has been a bit of a meme in Web3 because ownership has been somewhat like a dog that lives in your neighbor's garage. You can kind of look at it and pet it and sometimes, but you can't take it anywhere. So you don't really own it. And so interoperability is this next thing we need to do as a community, really make that work because that's the magic thing that Web3 can do that's different to Web2. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, just to try and and be the, the devil's advocate for a bit, because I, I completely agree with you that gaming is supposed to be fun. Uh, but then we have such a curveball when we see the banana uh, game. Uh, for those of you who might not know, on Steam there was this game called Banana. 
uh, which is like the dumbest game you can ever think of. It's a, it's a banana on a screen and you click it and you get points. Like it's a clicker, but more basic because you can't do any upgrades. And just, just for a bit of context, all time peak for this game was a little under 900,000 people playing at the same time. At this current minute, we have 308,000 people playing which is absolutely mad. Like, that's the, um, the the same amount as some of the biggest Web3 games out there. And that game is obviously not fun. So I guess that's... Uh, and the, the, the side note for this is there is, there is uh, earning mechanics where you get Steam items for this game. Uh, so, so it's actually more of a play to earn, but without the blockchain aspect. So do you guys think that this whole play to... It seems like this whole play to earn aspect is not even just web3 native but actually more global do you guys agree with that or i mean not to be the only person speaking here but i think play to earn sounds like a job maybe you can have earning aspects alongside play but if it's play to earn that that definitely sounds like work and so i think maybe there is a segment or an audience out there and that there is potentially short-term sustainable kind of economies through that but i don't think that would be called gaming if that was the purpose yeah i agree with that i agree i was just going to say that there's you know like was mentioned earlier the notion of economies being inside of games is kind of not a, not a new thing but it doesn't always have to be that that and revolves around financial rewards for playing like you can look at plenty of web 2 games out there where there's a create econ economy for example so you can build economies in different kinds of ways that have real cash flows and ultimately if whatever incentive mechanism you have isn't driven by real underlying cash flows then it's never going to be sustainable you know it might go up for a little while and then it'll drop off and then someone will go to the next thing so you kind of you know, start with build something fun that people want to do. If you're going to add an economic layer to it, make sure it's driven by real cash flows as opposed to some kind of externality that will subside at some point. So, so okay, I think that's a good point that has to be driven by real cash flow. But say that uh, a company like you guys then want to redistribute that some of that cash flow to your gamers, right? What do you think is the best vehicle for that? Is that like just giving NFTs or like how is, the, how is that? I think it depends on the game. You know, sometimes um, the in-game ecosystem can um, evolve or, or revolve around NFTs. And so there's value inside of that. Or it could be that, you know, there's liquid tokens that are incentives um, as part of the mechanics. We wrote a paper um, recently um, called The Material World, um, which you can check on futureverse.com slash research and describe how you can have a economy of materials inside of a game um, that could then be useful between different games. Um, so you can kind of create this cross, um, you know, inter intergame interoperability of materials and economy to bootstrap games that are starting out that may not have users or players or, or, um, or liquidity using that kind of system so you can have a range of different types of rewards in that um, but it really depends on the type of gameplay and that's where you want to always start is what's my core game loop and it doesn't make sense to have some kind of financial incentive inside of that aaron you guys also unmuted for a bit do you have something to add to this topic i think that position is probably accurate my I would kind of raise maybe another potential opportunity. So if you think about what we're doing with the third kingdom, which is a strategy simulation game, all about kind of finding resources and materials and more the kind of economic loop that web three likes, we're using that to bootstrap the economy using that material world protocol for open, which is a competitive battle Royale aimed at mainstream gamers you know, built with the Ready Player One IP, which we own. And so you can kind of maybe have a hybrid situation where you 
don't look at the market as one giant segment, but say there are different kinds of gamers that different want different kinds of things. How can you kind of create economic loops um, that could be um, tangible between games as opposed to try and shove them all into one segment and make them have one kind of experience? Um, so that's, I think, one of the interesting things about Web3 is that there's these tangential links between different games as opposed to like having to think about it as a vertical slice which would be the case in Web 2. And then I think the other thing, that the real magic of Web 3 is not the financialization because that's always been possible. Um, I was farming gold 20 years ago in World of Warcraft. And just on that point, I'd never want to sell any of the cool stuff that I have on my characters. I think if you make a fun game that people love and content that people love, um, they won't want to trade it. And I think that that kind of notion is a little bit silly. But the but the kind of underlying thing is that you can have this hybrid situation where you can kind of meet the segment of gamers who are interested in that um, economy, um, you know, side of things, and then link that to um, something that's more focused on the mainstream play because Web three allows this interoperability, and that is actually the superpower, not not the financialization. The interoperability part is, is definitely very interesting and I'm excited to see more and more use cases for that coming up here in the future. Uh, quick side note, uh, if you guys have any questions here in the crowd, make sure to comment them below and we can uh, look over them. Another thing, you mentioned a thing that I saw a while ago and that blew my mind. You also just mentioned now, you have the Ready Player One IP. Like for me, the Ready Player One it's like the metaverse movie type of thing. Obviously, there's more movies, but this is like the one that makes it really clear for, for me what the metaverse could look like in 10, 20, 30, whatever, 50 years, right? Uh, probably more 50 years with the worst stuff going on in there. But can you just quickly break down, like, what, how, how, are, how are you planning to integrate that IP and, and what's going on with that? Yeah, no, it's, um, it is a really fantastic thing, I think, that has happened, which is... Um, we worked with the creators of Ready Player One. So Ernie Klein, who wrote the novels, and Dan Farah, who produced the movie, was Steven, St Steven Spielberg. Um, and, uh, to, and it was really interesting because they, like you said, it's kind of like the go-to um, popular um, culture meme for what the metaverse is. And naturally, as as it as it kind of held that position, if people kind of talk about the metaverse, they say, go watch this movie. Journalists reference this when they talk about the metaverse. Um, so it has this kind of um, inherent kind of um, discoverability. And when we talked to the creators about um, what they wanted, they had been working with the biggest tech companies in the world. They'd had big multi-million dollar offers on the table to take the IP and to turn it into... Um, you know, whatever they thought their version of the metaverse was. Um, but actually, Ernie wanted this thing to be community owned. You know, he, Web3 wasn't alive when he made the, um, or wrote the books. But if it had been, that would have been the technology behind Ready Player One because he really cares about this principles of community and ownership um, of digital property and interoperability, all of those kind of under, underlying principles. So it's a really amazing platform to build on top of in terms of IP because people already recognize it. There are hundreds of millions of fans around the world who who follow this story. Um, and to get you know such a premium piece of IP into Web3 is a bit of a coup. So what we're going to do is two things to start off with. Um, one is the Readyverse um, itself, and that's kind of an immersive discovery um, experience you can go in um, and start from your personal lobby use our ai generative tools to build the world around you the characters and pets and objects and items that exist inside of that or um, work you know buy one of our premium um, branded partner ip so this could be a movie that you love or a tv series or a sports team or something like that so that kind of starts your personal lobby from there, you can start to explore into um, showrooms, which might be the front door, the kind of marketplace for a, ga a game or application or experience. And then you can go from there and jump into the actual game. And that can be 
built you know in unreal or unity or webgl or mobile or whatever it happens to be and you can feel like you're kind of jumping between these different worlds but each one of those things is built by by an, uh, a different developer or studio and i think if you look out there at web3 now um there's like a really big opportunity there isn't really a winner now for distribution and for discovery of games in this space and if we can take this ip that everyone already knows iconically as um the place to find the metaverse and turn that into customer funnels and expose them to all the the awesome builders out there that are building great games then we can kind of start to join those two worlds together and i think that's that, that this ip is no better there's no better ip than this to do that because that's what the whole story is about interesting interesting so when you say blend those different games in together uh is that only games created under your uh, no yeah no the platform or is it also yeah say totally Wild we have Wild yeah here. awesome guys love what they're doing cool team I, like i'd love to see a no we, we we have done a couple uh, of things like in the cool. past but i think like the idea is essentially that um it works a, a little bit like a cross between the oasis that you see in the movie and steam so developers can build their own games, you know, their own clients, their own experiences, and they can launch those from within the Readyverse. Or um, the um, users can create their own spaces so that they can kind of hang out with their friends and then queue up or um, discover the next thing to do. Um, so kind of a hybrid between, I guess, Roblox and Steam is, is what the Readyverse itself is. So very open to... Um, developers out there are actually working on um, our kind of top 50 launch partners for later this year. And Wilder, Wilder World would be one of the ones we'd love to have. I think they're one of the best builders out there in Web3. And um, and we've had some good kind of collaborations in the past. And this would be another one, I think, to, to build on top of. Aaron, I see you also had your hand up. Do you have something to add? Or not hand up? Yeah, no, I was just going to say, I think it's going to be quite an interesting it depends on the time dimension you're talking about but i think in the future um you know if you project far enough maybe things like games are the economy it's kind of an interesting thought to think about if you know ai takes over knowledge roles and robots take over labor roles what's left this kind of entertainment is left and so um you know far enough into the future maybe everything's a game um, and maybe there's income associated with that. Um, but I just want to contest a little bit um, the statements that were made before, which, which was, I mean, the game the game um, industry has always been driven by economics. These are like specialist roles that exist within the gaming industry and have for a long time. Um, and so the notion that there's something, some kind of new thing that Web3 um, offers when it comes to economics, I think is is kind of flawed um because you can already kind of create economies and there have been for 20 years that exist between um real world games and you know the real world economy sorry games in the real world economy web3 doesn't particularly um fix that problem or um create the opportunity but the but the thing that really does matter and i'll agree with um is the interoperability because ownership is the thing that web3 delivers that's the whole purpose of um, blockchain infrastructure is community owned infrastructure so you can have user owned digital property rights and so in the content space you know when it comes to things like your avatars or you know spaceships whatever it happens to be the thing that matters actually is making sure that interoperability is real and i don't mean interoperability between you know the things you build interoperability with the things everyone and anyone builds because you can't really own it unless you can take it with you. And so that's the thing that I think Futureverse has been really, really focused on is making interoperability real so that it can go between games, engines, you know, platforms, um, game formats, um, and, and be something that is transportable to those different um, game economy so you can have true ownership and that that is the enduring thing that i think that web3 is about at its very heart which is digital property rights it just has to for gaming content to be um owned in the same way as say a fungible token or a bitcoin like that something like that 
interoperability has to be extremely high. Otherwise, it's it's no different to Web2. I'm so excited for that. And I really do agree with that also on the ownership part being the biggest breakthrough. Uh, like coming from a background with, with GamerPay, which is a marketplace for Counter-Strike skins, like Counter-Strike skins have been around, which is, and Counter-Strike skins is kind of like NFTs without blockchain, right? They've been around for many, many years now, uh, older than than, than uh, NFTs concept themselves. Uh, and even Team Fortress, right? Like Team Fortress also has a huge economy where there's been studies on that digital economy, which was also really interesting to, to look at because it, there's even a reserve currency hat that people would measure other hats compared to because these uh, hats in the in the world were had like a real economic value. Um, but you, you brought up something interesting for the interoperability part, which just to also wind back, Let's just take the hype, hype or um, the example of Wilder World being accessible from inside the Futureverse platform. How would that actually work in, in practice? Because Wilder World has a whole download themselves, right? So if you were to step into some mm -hmm. Wilder World portal in Futureverse, wouldn't you have to download also Wilder World? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, so there's download. kind of um, three, I guess, layers of experience. You've got, um, you'd say, your personal lobby, which is your surreal estate if you've read the books in ready player one that's what they talk about is the kind of player owned space and that surreal estate can be either created with user generated content you know via our generative ai um or it can be um one of those premium ones like we showed um recently h's garage where you could kind of run around inside of that environment from ready player one um and then from there you can you can explore into say a community stronghold so this could be um uh, open or more public area where um a specific game might have their kind of brand content all that kind of stuff um maybe many activations inside of that there are showrooms which i talked about earlier which is kind of the mini marketplace for that game um it gives the user a little bit of a preview of what, what they might be getting into but if they want to launch the actual game so they go into to the readyverse and they want to launch um wilder world from from the wilder world showroom um, then the game client, you know, the uh, launcher client will serve them that game download for the first time that they need to go in there, kind of like um, how the Blizzard launcher works. Um, and then you'd be able to kind of open up that game, take any of your interoperable content in, and play that game. Um, and the next time you go in there, if you've already downloaded that client and it's the latest edition, then it'll just load and it'll like like be like you've jumped from the world. So the idea is to kind of stage the user experience. So there's little like moments between that initial discovery and the download. So it feels like one continuous journey for, for the user into that world. Okay, so we're coming up on the hour here. I know you guys are all very busy people. So make sure to go follow all of the speakers here because they have a ton of cool stuff they're building to push forward this space before we round off though i i want to just go around um to talk to different speakers share your alpha share what, what's coming up for you guys uh your roadmap do you have any upcoming events uh so let's just do a quick round of that before we, we wrap up uh aaron you've been so good at speaking today and i really do appreciate you so i think for all uh, i'll let you go first on this yeah yeah thanks for that um i think for us um if you're uh following the ecosystem we're launching the third kingdom in the next coming weeks which is kind of that um, material world um strategy simulation game which is aiming to create this kind of bootstrap economy for different games um if you love the ready player one ip then um, follow along with the readyverse account or um, visit open if you're into that kind of competitive battle royale format we're doing something really cool there with some of the best developers in the world from the AAA studios um, and so look out for that towards the end of next year follow visit open um, and, and stay tuned for that